If your business doesn't have these three things, you'll never sell it. Hi, I'm Jared Krause, host of the Buying Online Business Podcast, and today I'm speaking with Mike Finger, who has bought, built, and sold multiple businesses over the last 25 years. Now, Mike building his first business, was it was a rewarding challenge, but it really captivated him when selling his first business but the sale almost didn't happen. Mike was 10 years in with 50 employees when he found out the business he had, he built, was unsellable. It was devastating, but he moved forward and focused on changing a few simple elements in the business, which those changes made that first sale actually possible, and he says it changed his life. Now, Mike works to help other small business owners change their business so they can experience their own life-changing sale when the time comes, or change their business in such a great way that they don't want to exit their business. In this podcast episode, Mike and I talk about his rude awakening when he tried to sell his first business, some of the things that he had to actually deal with, and some of the things that he did to get his business more sellable and make that exit. And then we talk about the three critical things, three absolutely important things a business must have in order to sell it. And these are Mike's three things that he explains that He helps people as business owners move forwards to in their business to be able to get a desirable exit if they choose to. Then we talk about how much time you should actually give yourself if you wanna get your business ready to sell, which is an important thing because if you are at 65, you wanna know how much time you should give yourself to make an exit before you retire. Now, sometimes later in life, we don't want to give ourselves that much time. We want to do it in a shorter period of time. So it's better for you to know now how much time you should have. Then we talk about how to go from survival mode as a business owner and being up to your eyeballs and work to being in an empowered place as a business owner with freedom, which is actually options to be able to sell your business for a large exit or to hold on to your business that only maybe take a couple hours per week to run. Then Mike and I talk about stress expense, an expense that most people don't know exists because it's invisible, but you're paying anyway, depending on what level you're at in your business and what type of entrepreneur you are. Then we talk about the mindset of flipping versus buying and being in business for the long term and the acquisition entrepreneur and how that's an ever-evolving thing for us in the online business space. Now, this is such a beautiful chat with Mike Finger. I'm sure you're absolutely going to love it. But before we dive into this chat that we have, please understand that we're talking about buying online businesses here. Never go away and do this on your own, which is what we talk about in the actual episode. Make sure you go away and get my due diligence framework. It's free, which can help you take the guesswork out of buying an online business It's what I've used and my clients have used to help us buy multiple business. It's saved us a lot of money and it's made us a lot of money. So get that at buyingonlinebusinesses.com forward slash free resources. Now let's dive into this amazing chat that I had with Mike. Do you want to build or grow your content website? Niche website builders have helped hundreds of people to take their content websites from a few hundred dollars per month to over tens of thousands of dollars per month with crafted content creation, buying age domains and link building strategies. These strategies have helped people increase their traffic, authority, monthly earnings, and their website valuation too. Head to nichewebsite.builders forward slash B-O-B forward slash to get 10% off any link building or 10% more from their content creation services. That's nichewebsite.builders forward slash Bob forward slash. I'll put a link in the description too. Mike, hello. Hey, Jim. Welcome to the Bob Podcast. Great, great to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for coming on. You have a world of wisdom. Before we started, you said you may not be the best um, with knowledge of online business space, and I highly doubt that. Um, I wanted to talk to you about a little bit about the built, the buying of sites and what you've learned through your experience because you've bought and you've built and you've sold. Now you help a lot of people exit deals and there's so many things that go into exiting a deal you just can't do it straight away right before we move into the exiting exiting deals what sort of businesses have you actually bought and and why did you decide to go with those types of businesses was there a particular business model or was there you know what drew you to those sure sure uh my first two businesses were businesses that i had started from scratch and so i got the uh the long term 15 year life cycle in, in those initial businesses. 
So after we'd had a chance to sell and recover and all of that, when I was looking to buy, I was looking for businesses that weren't quite as complicated as the first two that we'd had. <laughs> so I was looking for fairly basic service model businesses. I was shopping car wash, laundromat, uh, convenience store, really any of those fairly straightforward model businesses because I, I knew that uh, I had learned a lot the first time through. I, I think I bought and subsequently sold those businesses to prove to myself that what I had learned the first time through wasn't a fluke. Uh, but really what drew me to their, to those businesses was was the simplicity of the model. Yeah. Okay. And so have you only mainly been buying and helping people exit offline businesses? Have you ever bought an online business or sold? I've never bought an online business myself. I've worked with those that have and worked that with those who have, have worked to sell those businesses. Mm. It's, it's part of the reason why I, I gave you the precursor I did about, uh, about knowledge about online businesses. I've made a conscious choice as I've, as I've grown and learned to really try to focus on a simple message. Because as you know, a lot of this space is, is driven from a content perspective by those we call acquisition entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. These are people that are essentially in the business of buying and subsequently selling. It's a great business model. There's a lot to be done in that space. But let's face it, most owners who sell do it once. Most owners who buy do it once. And so the question for me that became key in that space was what are the simple realities that a small business owner who is consumed by running their business can actually do while they're uh, you know, working that 80 hour week. So it was to try to find a way through to those to that simple messaging that would would translate whether you're doing online, offline or something in between. Yeah. I I believe the simple messaging is is so valuable because then people can use it at different stages and in different paths of like different types of journeys. For example, due diligence, right? Due diligence, I've helped people to buy a lot of online businesses, but also people have used my framework and used some of what I teach in buying offline businesses because it's got very similar principles. You still need to check similar yeah. things. Sometimes the online space is a few more things you can check and it's it's easier for verification and it can be done a lot quicker rather than offline businesses. But there's still the same principles like you should be proving a business is a bad investment. If you can't, then you must buy type thing. No, I, I love the breadth of that, right? Because so often we get introduced to the topic of buying or selling by someone who's taken a real deep dive in a very specific area. I know a lot of owners who got introduced to selling their business by going to a four hour uh, <laughs> you know, seminar on employee stock ownership programs. Well, I'm going to sell my business through an ESOP. Well, you've got five employees. You're not going to sell your business through an ESOP, but that's that's your introduction to it. And it's the same in the online space, right? I, I read the articles or I hear the presentation about this is the key metric, right? This is what this one metric is what determines whether or not you should buy this business. And it's like, well, maybe that's the key metric for this one one guy doing a certain kind of roll up. But does that extrapolate out to the to what most of the rest of us should be looking for? So when you talk about due diligence in a wide range of, I've looked at mm. this, now let's completely switch gears and look at something else. That's how we get the exposure. Yeah, I think that's to you've touched on a very valuable point the right there. Decision. A lot of people in join our community, our buying online business community, and are looking at deals, and they they are always asking you, what's you know, is this a red flag? And the reason they ask when they're looking at buying these businesses is, is this a red flag is because they want the excuse to be able to run away from the business and, and go to the next one to do due diligence on that. Um, and they want, they, they just want validation that it's not a good business through sure. one key metric when the reality is it's everything in total and you'd be silly to walk away from one business because there's one risk that you don't like when everything else could be absolutely perfect. And in essence, you could deal with that risk and that risk could actually be opportunity, right? All risks is just opportunity in disguise. And 
you may have just missed out on a really good deal, but you wanted the excuse to walk Absolutely. away and go find another business or make it an easier path without you having to do extra work doing due diligence on that business. And it's a, it's, this is the beautiful thing about it. People want it to be easy. They want it to not take too much time and just go away and buy or just go away and easily sell. But the beautiful thing is that it is complex and it is complicated and there's mer many things to consider, many metrics to consider, which allows us to take people that want to put in the effort, get the actual ROI from a good sale and get the actual ROI from a good purchase, which is, a, I believe, why you and I actually have jobs <laughs> and businesses because it is so complex. And I think that's so... That's right. So undervalued by so many people because they want to just do it the quick way. What do you think about that? It's, I, I think you're right on. This is a, this is not a black and white space. This is a shades of gray space, mm. right? Mm. Uh, I, I tell buyers that I've that I've worked with in the past. There's always a good reason not to buy a business. <laughs> I don't care what business you're looking at. You can always find a risk, a threat somewhere. Oh, why was the performance different six months? There's always a compelling reason not to buy a business. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's that, it, it's that uh, collective that you referred to where I look at this overall and I can see, maybe I see things that are broken, but they're broken in ways that I know how to fix. Yes. Boy, there's an opportunity to bring value. There's an opportunity to expand that business, grow that business. I've gotten to the point where when I look at businesses, I don't want a business that's working perfectly. I want a business that's broken in a way that I can fix. Mm -hmm. And that that's how you add value. That's how you bring in. But for so many going into this space, this is their first time through, right? Um, and that is a terrifying place to be. I, I, I've been on that transaction from all sides. And uh, I, I can remember I worked as a, as a business broker for a year, loved part of it, hated part of it. But one of the, you know, one of the initial training messages was this is a fear based transaction. Yeah. The seller's afraid. The buyer's afraid. Nobody wants to make a mistake. Um, shades of gray. That's that's what this is. And this the key word that you use here is fear. And when we're in fear we're not thinking clearly. And this is why I think it's so important to have, and it doesn't need to be me and it doesn't need to be you, but at least somebody that's got experience in the space to not be attached emotionally to the transaction that can provide a level head on whether this is a good, good path to go through in the sale or the purchase of a business. And that's, people just feel like, and there's too much, there's too much, I believe, especially in the online space and content online of like, I'm a self-made entrepreneur and I did it all myself. And I think that too many younger people are like, oh, I've got to do it myself. And I, I you know, I, I'm a, I'm a self-made millionaire or bazillionaire or whatever it is. And I think that's just ridiculous because every single person who's ever read a book or listened to one podcast or YouTube video has actually had help and support but why why do why is the message that so many people are self-made it's just an ego thing i believe and it's really just it's really destructive to younger entrepreneurs thinking they need to do it themselves when in essence the most successful people ever have a team around them and i believe we should start building a team when you when you go through the selling of a business mike and the exit are there multiple people that touch parts of the business or look at it before you go away and make an exit? Like, cons you know, consultants and people that help you set things up before you go away and can actually have this business that's ready for exit? Oh, always. I, I mean, the, the, the coaching I do of small business owners, by, uh, by design, I express to them, I am not a technical expert. Right. I, mm. I'm not the guy that knows the latest version of, of this program or that program or how the tax code changed or why in the world would I want to pretend to be good at that when I know the telephone number of several people who are good at that. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's bring the expertise to the table when we need someone to take the deep, deep dive on those areas of, of complexity. Um, but again, for the seller, it, 
It's about focusing on those simple elements that they can control. It, what we forget, Jared, is that most businesses that don't sell don't sell because of something simple, not because of something complex. Oh, that's most right. of the most of the failed deals, uh, failed deals, or just businesses that that never make a sale. It's because of something simple. Almost never because of I checked the wrong box on page 27. Why didn't I have the attorney done? Does that stuff happen? Of course it happens. And it's it's incredibly painful when you hear the story. But guess what? For every one of those, there's 100 businesses that didn't sell because they didn't have desirable results. Right? Right. Owner focusing on that instead of the page 27 detail. Let's. When I work with a client, we've got three key questions. Are your results desirable? Can a buyer duplicate your results? And can you document your results? Mm. If you can answer yes to those three questions as a small business owner, I don't care if you're in the online space, bricks and more, I don't care what kind of business you have. Those three questions should dominate your preparation for sale because those are the things that kill most deals and that lead you to success. Amazing. Amazing. So let's, let's unpack those three things. The first yeah. one is, is your, is your business desirable? Are your results desirable? Are your results desirable? Meaning that it's, it's on the, it's on an incline. Doesn't need to be hockey stick incline, but it's, it's actually a hockey stick incline might actually not be too desirable because can, can that new owner of the business actually achieve the same results at that at that level, right? So right. when somebody's looking to sell their business, what are some of the attractive things that it should have? Two, two key elements from my perspective. Um, depending on where you live, the term is seller's discretionary earnings, mm -hmm. owner cash flow, free cash flow. Quite simply stated, this is the financial benefit of owning the business. The higher that is, the better it is, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. seller's discretionary earnings is, is, is measure number one. The, the second thing that I encourage owners to look at is, is um, their job. What does it mean to be the owner of this business? Do you have flexibility? You know, can you go to the kid's soccer game? What life does this create for you? Because what we forget is when I'm the buyer, I'm shopping that life. Right. Mm -hmm. I get, I'm, I'm able to make an independent decision. And if this if this requires me to sit in front of a computer for 18 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, uh, that's no, not cutting you. it for me. Yeah. Right? You you haven't set it up the way that that brings it uh, brings it home for me. So I, I try to stress for owners that when we talk about desirable, it's not a trick. Right. It's when I look at your your engagement as the owner and the life it creates for you and I go, I got to get me some of that. If that's if that's how it feels looking at your business, uh, then you're well on your way to answering yes to that question. Ah, that's awesome. Because what you don't want, I've heard from somebody before is what you don't want to do is you don't want to go away. Most people are investing to make an income and have a better lifestyle, not shopping for a job through a business. And that's something we, we don't want to do. Right. I've noticed in right. the online space and it's done a lot by a lot of different brokers that they will put, it takes two hours per month to run this type of business or three or four, two to five hours. Sometimes it's right. 10 hours and sometimes they're realistic and sometimes they're not. A lot of the times they're not. Yep. And sometimes they are where the owner of the business may actually have everything systemized within their own head space and they can get things done really, really quick. But for a new owner, it might take twice or three times as much time. So Absolutely. I tell people to go away and look at the tasks and and ask themselves realistically as a new buyer, how much time would it actually take you as a complete beginner? And then that that's the hours of work that would be required to run the business for you, not for the previous owner, because they may have their own process in their own head that can get the work done quicker. Do you find the same is true for offline businesses as well? Like where people, you need to really be quite strict with like how much time you say it requires to run the business when you're selling it? Oh, ab ab absolutely. And what, what existing owners sometimes forget is that if I'm looking at your business as a buyer, I have to assume it's going to take me years to develop the level of com 
uh, competence that you have today running that business. Mm. And so in, 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 if I don't have the same skill set, or even if I do, there's still months or years of learning to go through to be able to operate the business as effectively as the existing owner. And that's why if that owner is miserable because of the conditions in the business, what chance do I have as a new owner mm. to step in and, and knowing I'm going to be less efficient and less knowledgeable and have a whole lot of catch up to do um, it, 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 in the online space as well? I mean, you see business uh, businesses there where the, the, in, the current owner is an expert in some specific technology or ad space or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not coming to the table with that same level of expertise, even if they're a projection was 10 hours a month, that's 10 hours a month for the expert. What does it mean for me as the novice? Hugely, hugely so. I'm so glad you touched on that. We have a lot of people come to the online space, Mike, that want to buy a business. And when they think about an online business, I think I could be generalizing, but most people believe an online business is an e-commerce business that just sells physical products online. I think that's what most people believe is an online business. So they come to me and say, Jared, I want to buy an e-commerce business. I'm like, okay, cool. What sort of skills and knowledge do you have? Uh, and they go away and look at an online business that's for sale. They do some due diligence and I say, okay, this business, most e-commerce businesses are heavily reliant on digital ads, like paid ads, PPC marketing. And they go away and look at this e-commerce business and 80% of the sales come from digital marketing and I asked them, that's cool. If you buy this business and this come, this plays into one of the factors that you say is important for the, the sellability of a business that rep, um, you should be able to duplicate the results of the previous owner, if not better. And this is one of the questions I asked them is I said, on look, this person's been doing digital marketing for how long? They've got the experience, the knowledge in how to produce these results from the ads. You know nothing about do you, how much do you know about digital marketing? If it's nothing, how confident are you that you can actually replicate the results that the previous owner is doing, if not better? Or do you know somebody you know, like, and trust that can produce these results, if not better? And can you afford those people? Because usually those people that can do that digital marketing cost a couple of thousands of dollars a month just in ad management on top of the the budget for the ads as well. And that's, an, that's a, enough of a question for a newbie to go, wow, I didn't realize that I didn't, I won't be able to replicate these results. Let's change the business model for something that, for where they're at in their own level of experience. Uh, I, I think that's such a critical point. And that, that, that's really interesting because it raises a question from my perspective. My sense sometimes in the online space is that some of these businesses are getting churned through, bought by someone who has a specific skill set, mm. can bring that skill set to that business, jack the results of that business over a nine-month period or a 12-month period, and then attempt to turn knowing that that upside isn't there anymore. I mean, do you, is that something you see frequently? There is a lot of people that are in our space that are flipping websites. So buying them, growing them in that, in that way, and then selling them. What we prefer yep. to look for is, and, and that can be, that can be a good thing because if somebody who is a newbie comes in and said, cool, they've grown the business in a way that I don't know how I can benefit from those results and they purchase it and they write off the, you know, the coattails of uh, them optimizing the business in that particular department. Now it depends on the business model and uh, depends on who's growing the business and selling it and who's purchasing it, whether it's a good investment or a bad investment. For some people, it could be a sure. bad investment, but for newbies with the particular business model they might be choosing, it could be a really good win. For example, if it's a, a blog where somebody optimizes the affiliate income, the conversion rates on that, and then also the ad optimization, that can stay in place for a long period of time. And the new purchaser of the business can really ride off the coattails of that for for multiple years and have somebody else come and change some things for you quite cheaply. Um, but if it's, for example, somebody who has done a lot of 
paid digital paid marketing and built out funnels and PPC campaigns, somebody who's brand new doesn't know how to do that. They could just buy it and butcher the whole thing if they, sure. yeah. So it can be a positive thing. It can be a negative thing. So now I want to come back to, I want to ask you the question on, so it was attractiveness is, and then you've got, can we duplicate the results, which we kind of covered just now. The last thing is, um, measuring and i think is it tracking things or or data can you document, document. your results yeah can you document them um and the, i will say that is probably of the three questions the one that's most different in the online space mm. right simply because there's so many resources available where i can where i can track or uh, the provability of the claims that you're making right what did you sell I can look at the Shopify records and see what you sold. What it, and again, it, uh, my sense is is that those aren't always fully transparent. That there's ways to uh, uh, play with the numbers, but compared to uh, uh, the guy that's got a box, uh, a shoebox under his desk with his receipts for the last two years, mm. uh, that online space offers some opportunity. I, I don't know that there's as much of the wink wink nudge nudge here's what my real numbers are in the online space yeah in the online space it's it's quite good because you do have digitally tracked transactions for sales and you can you know ads and for digital marketing campaigns how much is spent what's the return of all that sort of stuff and you can really break all that down what i do like to see if i was to purchase a business and i know somebody who has sold their business recently, they have a really good dashboard with all of their metrics and it's all accurate and all makes sense. And that's super attractive for a buyer. And the purchase, the purchaser of this business had quite a lot of capital. They've grown the business since, uh, and they purchased the business based mostly based off the SOPs. And the processes that that my my friend had built and the data the tracking and the documentation of their results um and i think that's highly highly attractive but there are some cases weird cases where i did have a gentleman come on the podcast probably like 20 podcasts ago now who did buy an e-commerce business from a particular broker he bought it himself he didn't have anybody supporting him it's his first online business port but purchase, it was a significant purchase in the six figure range. And they were selling e-commerce products on the Shopify platform. And what had been done is some people had, he checked the checked the, the sales records through Shopify in the back end. But what had been done is some of the sales were sales made by either the seller or somebody that the seller knows to boost up the revenue in the business but he wasn't able to highlight sure. that when purchasing it and realize after purchasing it that the results weren't typical of what he was purchasing it as, which is a massive shame. So you do need to know financial due diligence and things that we teach. It's a massive shame. Now, I want to ask you, you, you had the experience that you built your businesses and congratulations, 15 years in business is awesome. And that is, that's no small feat. And I think anybody that's getting into business should be thinking about the long term. And you have had two of those experiences of business that you've built. And then you come to, the, I think it might have been your first time that you realized you wanted to sell a business. You went to sell it and you you were unable to. And then you needed to make some changes. What what yeah, caused that you? That... Yeah. No, no, that, that uh, that's a... I apologize for jumping in, but it's it's just visceral, visceral for me, uh, Jared. Mm. I can still remember that day hanging up the phone, and it was those first two businesses. Um, uh, Ten years in, I've got 50 full-time employees. I figure it's time for me to make my exit because I'd come to the conclusion my employees were trying to kill me. And uh, <laughs> I, I pick up the phone to call the first broker and the second broker and the third broker, and I got the same messages. Oh, no. Um, not enough cash flow to owner dependent, all of these things that are pretty typical for yeah. most small business owners. But that was my two by four to the forehead moment where I was like, oh, being in business a long time doesn't mean you've created transferable value. 
Mm. right? Surviving doesn't mean you've created transferable value. The number of employees, the revenue, all of these things are meaningless as it relates to what it is that creates a business that you can actually sell to someone that they might find attractive. And, and that's for me where I, um, I spent the next five years making those basic changes. And it was that life experience that led me to the simplicity of those three questions. Mm. Because you know what? Of those three questions at 10 years in, I was okay on question three. My, my financials were pretty clean. Mm. But the other two questions, I was a hard no. Yeah. Were the results desirable? No. Were the could a buyer duplicate my results? No. And why would they want to? Because they weren't desirable to begin with. So mm. um that's what drove me back to that place of wait a minute. And and you know what, Jared, I got lucky because I got that moment um in my in my 30s. So many owners don't reach that moment until they're 65 yeah. and they're ready to retire. And mm. then they get that message of, I'm sorry, there's nothing here to sell. I have those conversations with owners where it's like, well, I built this thing. This is my retirement plan. I'm sorry, there's nothing here. And I, I don't want to have those conversations anymore, which is why I do the work that I do. Mm. It's one thing to find that out and be able to make changes or find that out and invest in a retirement fund or do those things, we've got to change that owner perception that survival is sellable. It's just not enough. You kind of realize like the business owner is so hungry, like in the survival phase, right? Like if you're in the survival, survival mode of like, I need to earn an income, I need to pay bills, I need to live a good lifestyle. What happens is you need you and you need it, but also you've just creating more, more responsibility that you take on and you put it on your shoulders. And at the end of the day, you want to sell this thing and you realize you've built a, a really good, it can be a, a good job, have some flexibility in it, but also you haven't really built an asset that can stand alone without you. Nobody wants to buy that job. Nobody wants to buy all of that responsibility. They want that responsibility outsourced to team systems and processes that anybody can sort of oversee. And we don't realize that until we go, oh, wow, it's a big wake up call. And I'm, I'm stoked that you found that out when you're 30, <laughs> because how long can, how long can it take businesses to, to make the turnaround? Like five years to this extra five years that somebody at 65 isn't going to want to endure, right? Well, absolutely. And remembering that for most business deals that are financed, the bank's going to look at a three-year track record. Mm -hmm. So even if I start today and I can flip the switch overnight, I've got a three-year track record to build to be able to document that what I want to happen is, is happening. And to what you said, Jared, we forget, I mean, for many owners, they're lucky if it turns out to be an okay job. Mm -hmm. There's many owners out there that are miserable in the work that they do. It's a lousy job. I, yeah. I ask owners, if your job sucks, why would someone pay you for the opportunity to do it? It, <laughs> it, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. But that's what so many owners believe. They believe that the fact that it's here and survived is enough. And uh, unfortunately, that, and that's why that such a high percentage don't sell. So how much time should, is to say somebody has the idea, we're talking about the typical person that the business is highly reliant on them and they've got a, they basically got a job, they don't have a business. Yep. How many, how much time should they give themselves to turn that into an asset that is an, that is an actual business before, before it's, you know, got the, it's attractive, the results can be duplicated and uh, the metrics are attract. Sure, sure. That's I know this is the tough one to answer because it's going to be dependent on each yeah, business, but is there a general? That's right. Yeah, right. Yeah. It, it, interestingly enough, sometimes I think it's, it's a second tier win, but sometimes I think it's a win for the owners to just say it's never going to happen. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they bail on the business. Mm. Maybe that maybe it's a good lifestyle business for them. But now they know that that exit isn't part of their path. And now I set up the uh, IRA or the 401k or the retirement plan. Or I, I have to make different plans for my future 
recognizing this reality. For mm-hmm. those that start to address it, this is a journey of years, mm-hmm. right? This isn't a journey of days or months because not only do we have to change our perspective about how we run the business, then we have to actually change the business to match that new perspective. Oh, you know, these employees I have aren't going to fit the bill. The contractors I have aren't going to fit the bill. I've got to, and it's that expansion and growth. And then you expand to the next level and the systems you've built at the level before don't work quite so well. And you're doing it again and again. So it, it's a, it's a journey of years, but, um, even done imperfectly, it can be an incredibly rewarding journey mm. uh, because it takes us out of that um, that trap that so many of us are are in. Have you ever had the experience where somebody comes to you and said, "Hey, Mike, I want to sell my business," and you help them get sellable over a number of uh, years, and at the end they go, "Wow, this is a really good asset and doesn't require me much time." Maybe I won't sell it. <laughs> uh, absolutely. And it's the reason I don't work on commission because yeah. ultimately I don't care if they sell their business. Mm. The goal is a happy owner, mm-hmm. either the current one or the opportunity for the next one to be. Mm. And and the, the truth of the matter is ownability equals sellability, right? Mm-hmm. The best business in the world to own is one that's easy to sell. Mm. And so that's, and I've, I've watched that, uh, uh, that relationship of love redevelop between an owner and their business. And truthfully, watching that is as rewarding, if not more rewarding than watching somebody sell successfully. Yeah. So it's uh, it, it's absolutely part of the journey. And I love that part um, because what it what what you've bought is the freedom to make the decision right now. Owners think they have that freedom. And the truth is, is that most do not. Mm. Most owners think selling is a choice. I'm going to sell my business now. Most aren't there. They do not own a sellable business. I've seen numbers as high as 80% uh, don't own a sellable business, yet most owners think they do. Yeah. And that, that to me is the cruelest part of this and because I lived that, right? I yeah. thought I had done everything right. I thought I had done my homework and then boom. Uh, sorry, Mike, we can't help you fix these things. Call us back in three years. Hmm. Yeah. Devastating. That is devastating. ready to walk out the door. Three, three extra years when you're at an age, I mean, for you at age 30 is, is, I mean, still annoying because you've got three years is a long time. Um, but for somebody that, oh yeah. And I was, I was in my mid thirties when that happened and I was burnt to a crispy piece of toast. Yeah, I was just nothing left in the tank. Yeah. 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 10 years of, 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 you know, 12 hour days that, um, Mm. I was toasted, but again, it was it was no one's fault but mine because guess what? You're the owner. Yeah, we have to take responsibility. And I think we've got to take responsibility not as just the worker working in the business. We need to take ourselves out and look at the business like in the book, um, uh, The E-Myth. Um, you don't, you yeah. know, they've got a job, but you, you should treat it as a business and build the SOPs. And that's a really good book, I guess, anybody listening, listening to this podcast is The E-Myth is a wake-up call for people that start a business or have a business and are tied to that business and don't have options. What you talked about is the freedom. I think before is like a happy business owner is somebody that has freedom. And I think those freedom like can be summed up between having options. They have the option to sell it whenever they want because the business is sellable, the option to keep it. They have the option to take the money and reinvest into something else. Have so many options, which allows that freedom. And I think absolutely when you're stuck in it in the business and it's a 12 hour day you don't feel like you've got freedom or options and you really don't have them do you (laughs) because you're tied in so i want right and 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 the the darkest part of that from my perspective jared is that it feeds into how most owners interact with this topic and they for most owners their plan is they wait and then they fail that, that's how most owners deal with exit. And um, again, for me, that's why the focus was on the question of simplic- simplicity around it. Even if someone listens to this, if an owner listens to this conversation we're having and gets excited, and by the way, I'm a, 
100% behind you on the recommendation of the E-Myth by Michael Gerber. That's mm. a that is a that's an easy recommendation and win for for a business owner. But even if they get behind that and they start diving into the space, it's so easy to get overwhelmed by the complications, by the complexity, by the uh, you know, dive into this program or this metric or look at this. This is really important. And it might be, but nothing compared to the core question of desirable results uh, that a, a buyer can duplicate and that you can document. Again, that to me is the lifeblood of this stuff. Yeah, those three principal guys, note them down. Um, so, so important. Have you ever gotten to the point, Mike, where somebody has done all of this work, replaced themselves with SOPs and team the business is no longer reliant on them and they go, cool, I can see how attractive this is now compared to where it was two or three years ago where the business was reliant on me. Now the business runs itself. It can get the same results, if not better, without me having to lift as much of a finger as I did previously. And they, re they have this expectation that because the business is set up so good now, they have an expectation of how much the business will sell for. Has, have you ever seen that holding people back in terms of they, they put it up for sale, they've got a price in their head and they don't actually sell it because they've got an expectation on how much they're going to get for the business? Is that a, is that a thing? You know, that's really interesting. Um, I, I don't know that I've seen that. I, I've seen the... Um... I've seen the the flip side of that. And I just had a client who sold his business that had gotten it to that place, right? It was, it was very independent. He was there maybe five hours a week. Mm. Um, it was, the results were great and he didn't put it up for sale. What often happens with those kinds of businesses is people see that, right? So yes. he got a knock on his door and because of that circumstance, it put him in the place. It, it, it's just, it's the dream negotiation place. Jared, I don't have to sell my business. Mm -hmm. Your offer isn't enough. If you'd like to offer me X, then I'd consider it. But I'm happy. I'm thrilled to continue owning this business. What an enviable place to be when it comes to selling your business, <laughs> yes. right? I, I, I mean, because if I'm fine continuing to own this thing and you're not willing to meet my price, mm -hmm. I'll talk to you later. It's uh, um, it, I, I, I'm trying to think of a, a direct scenario where I've seen someone get to there. I will say that part of the process is education about the market. Mm. And so hopefully by that point, um, they've become aware enough of what the likely market value of their business is so that they can educate their expectations. But again, as I as I'll tell clients, um, what we want to do is we want the business to operate effectively so that you can meet your price goal. It doesn't mean you have to list for that price goal, right? Mm -hmm. You can list the, you can list the thing for for more than that and see if there's an opportunity. And if it doesn't sell, that's okay too. So um, yeah. That's the win-win opportunity that, that you have if the business is set up that way. H have you seen that scenario you talked about in the online space? Yeah, it's a good question. I think a lot of people, when they're flipping deals, especially with content sites and blogs and stuff, they, they're, I, they're buying the business with the ideology of them going to sell it and make a profit on the flip. I believe a lot of people will have an expect, and it's good, like, I think a lot of people's expectations have recently been met because of the market conditions where mm -hmm. just after a pandemic, everybody wants to be online, don't want to have to continue working. I've got a bit of money. How about I buy an online business and I work from home? The multiples of the businesses have gone up and for what people are paying for the businesses. So it has been a seller's market for the last few years. So I think people's expectations have been met. And I think maybe, I don't know what will happen in the future. Anything can happen, but there could be a time where people do have this expectation of, I'm going to buy this business for however much, maybe it's a hundred K and I'm going to build it up to 200 K in this period of time and then sell it for, you know, for the, for the, for double what I paid for it. And they might get to that point and be realize that they can't, they can't get that um, for the work they put in. Sure. I just think it's, I just think the math is just working differently. Yeah. And I think it's something, the reason I asked you is because it's a mindset thing. I think it's something for people to consider. 
if you bought something for 100k and you couldn't sell it at 200k but you sold it at 180k is that so bad like would you just take your take the money off the table have an 80k profit and reinvest into something else and learn from that experience and make the business more desirable <laughs> more replicatable um or easy you know get, get the results from the the, the the new owner can get the same results and um measuring it tracking things yeah um I, it, it, the it's really interesting what comes to mind to me with what you said is how different it might be if for, for the acquisition entrepreneur to just the regular business mm. owner right mm. if, if i'm in the business of flipping businesses there's a very different metric and method there than if i'm the person who's built this business and i'm ready to exit it at some point in the future it's uh that to me is a fascinating part of this because there's so much content that crosses over both those spaces yeah and i'm not sure truth is always the same in those different buckets yeah i agree it's a different it's a very different strategy and i'm more for like i like acquiring businesses but not with the intention to flip because I like to play a longer game and I know the sure. longer I play, the better compounding and better returns that I'm going to get versus buying and selling and flipping. You have to take a bit of money. You, you, you have to pay fees in terms of how much you give a broker. If you're going to sell through a broker, if not, the fee is going to be your time and trying to sell it yourself, being your own broker, but you've also got the fees uh, of finding a new business again and again and again and again and then having to sometimes you can use the same systems um, sops and team to buy the same type of business model and grow it and keep buying those types of businesses which you can use as leverage for a business that you're actually purchasing but also not every single business is the same and you will need to spend time effort and energy and resources tweaking some of those systems and if you don't even use the same business model then it just ends up being a lot more work that's my philosophy yeah. that's my personal philosophy yeah. um i think that there's too much too much effort and energy and time and resources being spent in the flipping space versus if you can play if you if you're not in a i think people that are in survival mode need to make cash and they will be prepared to spend a lot of time effort energy and resources to do so for myself in a position, like I'm in a unique position where a lot of other investors that may be as well, that I like, I'm not a gazillionaire, but I don't need to, we don't need to make it work really, really fast because I need to get out of a job. And I think that when you get out of that sort of position of survival, you can play a longer game and have less stress around, I need to pay bills. And I think that's a beautiful yeah, place absolutely. to be. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I would agree. I mean, they're both valid strategies. The last two businesses I bought and subsequently sold in less than three years, mm -hmm. and those were both turnaround by design mm -hmm. and w with, with good results, but they were fundamentally different than my, my first exit mm -hmm. in, in intent, in plan, in, in process. Uh, I thought I was going to own those first years, those first businesses forever. Yeah. And so that changed. So yeah, no, I think that's a great point you made. It's, uh, um, and, and I think it's important for owners to recognize that the journey makes a difference where, where you're starting, what you're doing. Sometimes you've got to take the advice we hear with a, with a grain of salt. Yes. Yeah. I believe, I believe in that there's an expense that a lot of people pay that they don't know they pay and it's called stress expense. Something I sort of like coined, uh, a while ago how much stress are you carrying when you're doing a lot of activity in a short period of time i.e trading markets businesses whatever it is versus buying and holding in the long term what's the stress expense you would pay there um and i don't and it's an invisible thing right that people don't know that they're paying but it takes a mental toll uh, and, and energetically, um, and physically. So I think, yeah, I, I think in those terms and I liked, like my goal isn't just more money. It's have a better lifestyle and sometimes have a better lifestyle. It can be minimal stress. Sometimes good stress, healthy stress is, is valuable and important to help us level yep. up. But something that I just, I consider when investing and yeah, living, and I just 
there is, and sometimes we need to go through those, you know, those, you know, diamonds are made under pressure. Sometimes we need to go through maybe the flipping stage of flipping sites, stress and pressure for allow, to allow us to become solid as, and business owners that have a really good mindset before we go, now I'm going to sit and chill and, and pay less stress expense. Have you seen that in other people's life cycle journeys as an entrepreneur as oh, well? Oh, absolutely. I, I'm just, I'm flashing through my head, the different conversations I've had with, with some of my, my coaching clients, especially when we're, we're new in our relationship together, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. so often the burden that they're carrying, I, I describe my, my initial ownership as a, you know, 80 pound bag of potatoes that I was carrying on my back. It was just, <laughs> yeah. it was visceral. It was yeah. Uh, the stress that was was there, and I, I love the I love the term um, the stress expense. That it's it's a very real thing for so many owners, and some of it's reality. Some of it is stuff we make up in our head. Um, mm. Some of it is unavoidable, right? I mean, oh, yeah. you're a new business owner starting out, man. If you're not a little bit stressed, I I, I I'm a little worried for you, right? Because it's <laughs> yeah. a it's a it's a harried place to be, but. Um, yeah, that that development you talk about, you can see it. It's mm. just fascinating to watch as the owner goes from that place of survivability. I, I, I tell owners that I'm not a start with the end in mind guy. I'm not a mm -hmm. day one, you should have your plan for exit. Our first goal is sustainability. Mm -hmm. Let's get to that place where we're not panicked every day about every decision. And then after sustainability, our goal becomes sellability. It's yeah. just... That that's how how we drive ourselves to a place where we can go either way, and that is uh, that is a wonderful place to be as an owner. Just yeah, magical. Yeah, sustainability allows you to. I want to think about stress is like when you get into the sustainability phase. Stress is stress can be a bad thing when we're trying to make decisions. For example, if you're rushed and you try and you know you're running out the door and you're like i can't find my keys you know that might be in your pocket and you're making you know the, not the best decisions to look under the couch and all that sort of stuff when it's right there in the pocket is something you can't see because you're stressed you're freaking out you don't have time and when we try and make decisions sometimes we you know crash our car or stub our toe or whatever it is we're running around like a headless chook for lack of a better term and because we're stressed and we don't make the best decisions when we're stressed but when you're in a sustainable place then you can have a level head, be a lot more grounded, a lot more confident in that that goal of the sellability, the exit, the goal that you have in mind. And I think that's way more empowering place to come from, way more empowering energy to have when you want to, because you got when you, when you set a goal, you should have confidence in it rather than setting a goal based out of survival and stress. Right. You're less likely to hit that because you're stressed about it already. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I love the visual that you just described there, Jared, because I think of owners, I think of myself. I don't think you can always tell that from the outside, right? Because mm. there's times when as an owner, I was up to my eyeballs, but loving every minute of it yeah. and in flow and, you know, yes. doing the thing. And, and then three months later, I'm up to my eyeballs and I feel like I'm drowning. Mm -hmm. And mm. uh, th th it's a, it's a, it's such an important element of that owner's journey that you talk about. And some of it comes from external issues, right? If I'm betting the last dollar I have in my bank account, yeah. that's more stressful than, you know, if you're two or three exits in mm -hmm. and you have a little cushion, but correct. Um, good, good days and bad days, right? Yeah, definitely. Up and down journey of ownership. Yeah. It's, it's, there's so much. I believe mindset is like a huge percentage of it. And if you can have yourself in the right mindset, then you can make better decisions. And at times, you know, being up to your eyeballs in, in, in work, but everything's like, you're loving it. You're in the chaos, like organized chaos type thing. It's, you know, yeah. you can get things done and it's working really, really well. But like the other, other example, you said, sometimes you just like, you're just like, where's my snorkel? Like I can barely breathe underwater here. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. Or, or even worse, when you, you walk in and your feet get a little wet and you're like, what's going on? Yeah. I mean, it's just, oh, that we could talk for hours about that owner mindset and how we get to that place. But mm. and, and unfortunately, 
that stress moment is often the trigger where someone says, I got to sell this place. Yes. Right. Now I got to get out of here. And all of those dominoes we talked about earlier start to fall. Oh, I'm sorry, you're not ready. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't document your results. Or I'm sorry, being in that place of high stress, which I was at the time, I, I got by by the skin of my teeth. It, it yeah. My story could have gone legitimately Self. the complete opposite way. Mm -hmm. Because um, for so many of us as owners, when we reach the end of the line there, we can't. We don't. We're not able to find the next couple of years to to change it. And uh, yeah. I feel very lucky to have have had the support um, and ability to to go through that. And that's part of the reason I do what I do now. Is I, I talk about the day I remember hiding under my desk because I just mm -hmm. didn't want to deal with another employee issue. But there's a way out from under there, and there's a way to do it differently. And I try to bring a lot of sympathy to those owners who are in that place because a lot of us have been there. So yeah, yeah, and I think that's what you why you, what you do is is so great. So Mike, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, people that are listening, they they they're going to make an exit one day. Where can we send people to check you out, check out your stuff? Your link. Sure, you can you can find me at exitoasis.com. I'm most active on LinkedIn, uh, so you you can you can connect with me there as well. All right, cool. We'll put the links in the show note, guys. Mike, thank you so much for coming on. Everybody that is listening, thank you for listening. If you are a business owner or you know a business owner, at some stage you're more than likely going to make an exit. Please share this podcast episode with another business owner that you know will make an exit in the future because this is gonna be so valuable for them to listen to. It helps us spread the word selfishly, get more viewers and listeners listening to the podcast. So it helps us grow and help more people get a higher impact, but it's also helping you help your friends and support them further in their journey as well. So thanks so much guys and I'll speak to you soon. Hey YouTube watcher, if you thought that video is good, you should check out this video here on the two best types of websites beginners should buy. Or check out my playlist on how I made my first 100K from buying websites and how to do due diligence. Check it out, it's an awesome playlist, you'll enjoy it.